Joining me today is an author, the editorial director of the American Institute for Economic Research, as well as a senior fellow at the Austrian Economic Center. Jeffrey Tucker, welcome to the Rubin Report. Thanks for having me, good to be here. I almost wore the same bow tie, my friend. Really? I should have brought one extra there, for you. <laughs> that, yeah. that would have been <laughs> we nice. We can work on this. <laughs> All right, there's a ton I want to talk to you oh, about. Yeah. You're, you're sort of uh, one of these people that are right around all of the topics that I'm mm. talking about, from yeah. freedom and liberty and free speech mm. and the battle between the left and the right and all that. But your new book, and I want to get the title absolutely correct, Right Wing Collectivism, The Other Threat to Liberty. I thought that would be the spot for us to kick this off because most of the people watching the show know that I've mostly focused on sure, the left. Sure. That sure. was my home, sure. I was a progressive, I've woken up to what I sure. think real liberalism is, obviously, and that has nothing to do with the modern left. But sometimes people say, Dave, you don't critique the right enough. So let's well, dive know, what's, in. What's interesting about that, talk about too, right. is that so often the left and the right are not as distinguishable as they, they seem to be. For, for example, uh, the, the, this, this trade stuff, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Donald Trump basically agree. Yeah. You know, how do you account for that? And, and now we you see all the celebration of the working classes, you know, you're gonna get again, uh, the Trumpian right agreeing with uh, Bernie Sanders on, on that. Uh, the left is ever more trendy nationalist in its immigration policies, for example. That didn't used to be the case. So how, how is the left well, nationalist in immigration? Well, policies? like Bernie Sanders complained that free, free immigration is, is a, Coke, a Coke industry's plot, uh -huh. basically to provide the capitalist class cheap workers, for example. Now, that, you would have never found anybody on the left 20 years ago saying that. But, but now, you, now it's happening. You know, the, 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 the hatred of, the, of, of commerce and, and the, the merchant class is so intense now that if a luxury resort in, um, in Florida wants to hire some, some immigrants uh, to work for them, then the left is saying, oh, no, this is, this is terrible because this, cap this is capitalism at work. So you're starting to see this strange blending the left and the right have different cultural pitches, uh, uh, different appeals, different constituencies, but they both have this this agenda that's, that boils down to the, to the use of power. Is this a little bit of just what people refer to as the horseshoe theory, that the more that the sides have become sort of extreme, that they're oddly that, that coming may be, to That coalesce? may be right. I've heard this, this horseshoe theory. I tend to think it's a little bit superficial. I mean, I look at it a little bit more historically. And you see, since, uh, since liberalism was born in the world in the 18th century, really high Middle Ages, but when the revolt against liberalism began in the early 19th century, right, too much change, too much wealth, the wrong people are getting rich, there's not enough control, what are we going to do about our religion, our language, our race? You know, this, the revolt began to grow from about the 1820s and, and intensified and spread. Uh, to the United States, uh, Britain really began to take root in continental Europe. There, there took two forms. There was a, a left form and a right form. And in each country, they took, they took on different iterations, different names, you know. So, so in Britain, you had the Tories, then you had the Lab Labor Party. They both wanted to use the state for their own purposes. Then you always had the opposition party, which was the liberals, mm -hmm. you know. And, and that's the way it's fleshed out itself in country after country. The liberal party, has always been the people said, why don't we just let society be, let people live their lives. Let them choose a religion of their own, of their own choice. If they don't hurt anybody, it's not a problem. Let's have free speech. Let's have um, universal rights. Let's have rights for, let's, let's get rid of slavery. Let's have rights, uh, acknowledge the, the existence of women's rights, uh, equality of freedom for everybody. Leave everybody alone. That's the liberal position. That's a pretty, Good position. It's a, it's a it's a beautiful position, and it's and it's what I favor. It's what I think. It's what built civilization. Coming out of the religious wars of the High Middle Ages, we discovered this idea of freedom. We tried it. It worked, but there's but there's a there's always been a revolt brewing against it. A resentment, a resentment against it, a get resentment against the commercial class, too much change, too much wealth, the wrong people getting wealthy, we're not controlling demographics well enough, there's not enough equality, whatever the thing is, it takes different forms in different countries and in different times and different places, but ultimately the right and the left are ideologies of control and power, and liberalism has always been the alternative to that. So, so we keep having to rediscover this again and again in every generation. Yeah, well, that's why 
now I'm so happy that there is, as you said to me right before we started, the phrase classical liberalism yeah. is coming back. You know what I mean? You yeah. hear it on TV every now and again. I yeah. like to think that maybe I had a little something to do with it, you know? And, and it, to, me, to me, it is the only current antidote to the problems that we have. Either the, the more state power that the democratic socialists want as they've sort of ransacked their own party and, and purged all of the liberals. That's and true. it's also the antidote for all of the people. If you think Trump is all of the horrible things that people say about him all the time, what's the antidote? The antidote isn't to get somebody else in that has More that power. much power. Yeah. The antidote obviously is to take power away from that. That's what liberalism is. Well, and I, my hope is that, that there are the good people on the left, the center of the left, that are looking at the, the emergence of the Trump problem uh, will reconsider. Uh, the uses of power and the executive state and why do we build this gigantic machinery of the total state if it's so vulnerable to being captured by our enemies, right? <laughs> right, that's, the, that's the, the real question that yeah. we're at right now. If you believe this thing has been captured by the Russians or whatever it is, it's like, yeah. well, yeah. Okay, you're yeah. kind of answering your own question. So, so I hope that we can we can rekindle a kind of a new resurgence. I do have to credit you and, and Jordan Peterson for this I mean, I've been working at it for about 10 years to try to bring back this, the, not just the term liberal, but the, but the concept of liberalism um, to, to public life. And, uh, but it's been difficult because, because, because we do have this state that creates a kind of moral and intellectual and ideological hazard. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to control it. And, and now that we, we built it over the last hundred years, this, this, this total state of massive taxes, regulations, interventions, uh, running people's lives, everybody's trying to get hold of it and grab it and beat up their enemies. And it's a problem. It's a serious problem. So when people say to me, and we've discussed this on the show a bunch of times before, and I've dress, addressed this in several forums, when people say to me, wait a minute, when, you're, when you say you're a classical liberal and you talk about laissez-faire economics and getting the government out of the way and all those things, really this is just a repackaged libertarianism or you're just afraid to say that you're a conservative because it's still not cool or something like that. Yeah. Is, is there, how, how would you define the difference between, say, a classical liberal and a libertarian. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that because yeah. uh, because after World War II, uh, these neologisms, these new terms came along. Uh, one was conservatism. It wasn't really used before the early 1950s. Russell Kirk's book called um, uh, The Mindset of a Conservative, something like that. Conservative Mind, I think is what it was called. And libertarianism was, uh, again, uh, first used in about 1957. Hmm. Um, by the translator of uh, the works of Bastiat. The problem was the term liberal had been captured, you know, by the New Dealers mm -hmm. as early as 1933, once they acquiesced to the idea of the corporate of a state and were blaming the Great Depression on capitalism. Um, that became a problem for liberalism. They kept the term liberalism but they were no longer liberal. Because actually. they were suddenly for big government. They were for big government yeah. and, and even worse, the corporate state. And actually we can just be more blunt about it and say that back in the 1930s, this, this, this ideology had a name and the name was fascism, yeah, okay? Yeah. So, so they caved, right? I mean, in the New York Times in 1933, the New York Times Magazine was celebrating the great pref Professor Mussolini and how he and FDR shared a vision for the planned economy. So that's the world we were living in back then. So we, we lost the term liberal. After World War II, there was an attempt to, to just speak a language and, to, and to, to describe who we are. And on one hand, you had this new thing called conservatism. And they, they, they kind of sampled some of this Tory, Tory-like nostalgia for the past, a little bit of revanchism, you know, let's mm -hmm. recapture what we've lost. Then on the other hand, you had the genuine liberals, and they coined the term libertarianism, which had been sitting on the shelf since the late 19th century. Now, most of the people who called themselves libertarians in the late 19th century America and England were anarchist socialists, but nobody had bothered with the term for decades and decades. So Dean Russell said, well, nobody's using that word. Why don't we use it? And that was closer to the truth of what they were, it, in, it, in effect. Right? Well, what was interesting about that is, as Dean Russell described it in his 1957 article, it was a synonym for what was once called liberal. Right. He didn't think it was a, 
a tweak or an improvement or a distillation or a refinement or a, a new dogmatic way of describing liberalism, he thought it was liberalism. So I need, so, I need to read that because that yeah. I mean that's how I feel. I don't if someone says to me, Dave, you're a libertarian. I don't mind that. If we need labels, I don't mind that label. I don't mind really. the label I, I, You know, we can split the difference on how much government sure should be. Used. So the problem, I think, libertarianism as a number as a term has yeah. a number of problems. One is it's a little clinical sounding and it has too many syllables and it makes yeah. you sound a <laughs> little bit awkward, and it it sounds maybe a little too canonical. You know, like we we have. A, a list of things you have to believe, you know, like th this, this, this. It's all rooted in this kind of reductionist, uh, more commonly these days, it's rooted in this kind of a, a reductionist non-aggression principle, which is a fine principle as a rule of thumb, but it's not a good, it doesn't describe the whole of life. So mm -hmm. uh, the other problem is that libertarianism is, is a new term, so it doesn't have a deep history. So we can't look back and say, oh, look, the libertarians freed the slaves. The libertarians uh, acknowledged the rights of women. The, the libertarians gave us the commercial society that built the middle class and brought dignity to the average person. You know, right. If they had existed as a party, they would have done those they things. They would have done those yeah. things. Well, I mean, it's the liberals who did that. But it's the liberals, But yeah. we changed our name, so now we can't like feel a sense of pride hmm. in our past, so it doesn't have a past. Hmm. So that's a problem. So we're, uh, libertarians tend to be de detached from their own history for that reason. And I think it's a, it's a problem, it's a word problem. The second problem is that libertarianism doesn't have a universal of usage, like whereas liberalism does. Mm -hmm. You can go to Spain, describe yourself a liberal. Brazil, there's, there's liberals. In Germany, there's liberals. Every, there's a word for liberalism in every language, and it more or less means the same thing except in the United States. Right. So, uh, so uh, if we acquiesce to this term libertarian and just wipe out our liberal history, we're cutting ourselves off both from the world and from our own history. It, it's so funny because you've just said it in a far better way than I think I've ever really laid it out, but people will say to me, Dave, stop saying you're a liberal. And I don't want to stop saying I'm a liberal. I get that I'm you fighting a, an uphill battle right now, right? I'm a, I'm a salmon swimming upstream. This is gonna be tough but I don't want to deny what is the truth just because it's, because it's tough. It's who you are, and you want, to, you want to have an ancestry. You know, you want to look back and, and see uh, the, the champions of the Medici's in, in f 15th century uh, Florence and say, I know those people, those are my people. Yeah. You know, the people who long for a world without slavery you know, in the early 19th century. The people who wanted free trade and fought hard for it. Those are our people. That's our history. I mean, we were, we were born as part of a long stream of emancipation that's been taking place for 500 years. That's our movement, our people, our history. Let's embrace it. I'm with you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> All but, right, so it, are yeah. there any of those liberals uh, part of the Democratic Party anymore. Do those I, people uh, exist? Well, anymore? strange things are happening on the left. Very strange things. And I, I'm not sure. I should pause you for one sec. I, my original question here was I wanted to do the deep dive on the right. Yeah, so we're going to get, we'll we'll get, we'll get, get, no, we we'll will get, get no, I promise talk, you we're going to get to that. Well, this is I really, a funner topic. I mean, the, yeah. the, the deep dive on the far right gets us into a very dark place. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, maybe that, all right. So maybe the whole second half will be on that. Yeah, okay. Let me just put that out there right now. That's what we'll do for the second. I'm just now getting out of my depression having finished no. my book. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our whole second half is going to be okay. what my first question was about, but yeah, let's, yeah. let's just keep going on yeah, this yeah, yeah. road for now. So, so strange things have happened to the left. Um, let's just mention the, the, the phrase cultural appropriation, for example. Now, when, when did that, the approbation of this idea of cultural appropriation came out, like, what, two, three years ago? Three, yeah. four, five? I don't know. Academia is weird. It may have been brewing for 10 years. Yeah. But when I first heard about it, I thought, that is the craziest bunch of nonsense I've ever heard. I mean, civilization is nothing but cultural appropriation. We've been doing this since, since the ninth century, you know, at the, at the uh, height of uh, the Confavincium in, in Spain, where, where Judaism and Islam and Christianity came together in this beautiful melting pot where we all learn from each other and the cultures began to blend and our religions began to change and our, our outlook on life began to, because we learn from each other. If we stay isolated in our little tribes, we're never gonna progress. And, and, and the idea that, and I don't know if it was inadvertent or what happened, I mean, we can talk about this, but 
that when, when suddenly you're told you cannot have affection for another culture and take what you find valuable and, and learn, learn for yourself and live a better life, that is very strange. They seem to think it's cultural annihilation, not cultural appropriation, right? Like they seem to yeah. think that this is something that will lead to the destruction of that culture, I, when in fact, yeah. it actually spreads the ideas yes, of yes, that yes, yes. culture, the foods, the, well, the clothing, the, the, the ideas, the, not just the They're treating things. culture as a scarce good, like it's a property, but it's not. The magic of culture, which is the same magic of ideas, is it resides in its infinite reproducibility and its malleability. This is something that the world of ideas can do that the physical world cannot do. And if we don't make that distinction, we're gonna get very confused. Do you see what I mean? I, I mean, do. Like, cultures spread and they, they're infinite uh, and they can constantly change. And that's the magic and beauty of, of culture. We, we can't get that out of this glass of water, this table. Right? They're, they're, they're bound by the constraints of scarcity, but the world of ideas is, is magical. It's like a constant, constant infinite sandstorm, you know, unpredictable and, and constantly changing. And we can, we can take a, a culture for ourselves without taking it from somebody mm -hmm. else, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's reprodu reproduction. It's infinite reproduction. It's the loaves and the fishes. Isn't, isn't the beauty, too, that America has done this better than anyone perhaps in the history of the world? You, you just referenced yeah. some other points in time, but yeah. that we have taken in more cultures, and you said the phrase melting pot. I mean, that, that's what we designed and set up here the most beautiful melting pot ever. I, I lived in New York City for most of my life, most of my adult life at least, and would be on subway cars, and you were on that car with absolutely everyone, with ev know. white guys with dreadlocks and the whole thing. And I guess know. what, you may not like everybody, and you may no. not like the way this guy smells, and that person may be doing this, but we're all there, but it's and magic. we're living together. It's magic. You know, it's, it's, it really is commerce. It's because this country, elevated the commercial ethos to be the, the, the highest thing, the great ennobling factor of, 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 of human life. And it's commerce that brings people together. And we experience that every day. You know, you can, in, in a commercial setting, uh, people aren't fighting each other, they're, they're getting along. I mean, I, I find, I'm with you. I go, to, I go to a restaurant and I get served by some guy from, from uh, Pakistan. It's, it, it's a chance to meet somebody new. It's a chance to engage somebody and have a personal relationship with somebody who's serving you and you're serving them and you experience this magic of exchange. Uh, Benjamin Constant used to talk about this in, in the 1830s, how, how, how commerce brought to the world a new understanding of freedom and a new opportunity for us to find value in each other, in service of each other. And, and America just flourished in commerce, and that's why that's why we have, you know, the the, the diversity and the, and this melting pot, as you t call it, and this rich cultural life. You know, it's so funny because I'm so keenly aware of it right now. Not only because yeah. of the conversations I'm having and because people are screaming mm. about this stuff all the time, but you know, I'm on this tour with Jordan Peterson, and when I go to every airport that I go to, I 90% of the time, unless someone set a car for me, I take an Uber. And yeah. I just hop in whatever Uber That's shows so great. up. Right. And there is there there is every single type of person that looks every which way, and every color, every sexuality. And usually I talk a little bit to, to them. Yeah. It's you know. And it's like, man, these are just people. I, I you know, I'm, I maybe you feel the same way. Uh, you know, I, I live in Atlanta, which is just a gigantically diverse society, mm -hmm. you know, and everywhere you go, you're bumping into people who are different from you and and uh, hang around in crypto circles in Atlanta. I want to talk to yeah, crypto yeah. as well. And and that you talk about a melting pot. I mean, we're all together and there, we all consider each other our people, you know, just because we all love crypto. And it has nothing to do with, with race. You can appreciate racial differences, with, but also see value in everybody and, and hope they can see value in you. You can come together. It doesn't mean that we have to be egalitarian or, or deny differences. It means that we find strength in our heterogeneity. And, and that's... That makes for a beautiful and exciting life. Uh, one of the strangest things that's happening now, you know, with the rise of the alt-right, in response 
to the failures and, and strangeness of the left is this new celebration of homogeneity mm -hmm. as if, oh, we need to live in a unitary racial state, you know, where we all speak the same language or all uh, have the same religion. So that strikes me as aesthetically very boring. And I don't, I don't even recognize what that world would, would look like and feel like. And it doesn't appeal to me in the slightest bit. Yeah. Minority was built out of the out of the diversity that grows out of commerce. And the commerce is the key, because that's what helps us invest in each other. You know, Adam Smith said this about the division of labor, right? It's like, what causes wealth? The division of labor. How big can that be? It should be as big as possible. The wider the division of labor, the more people you include in the great project of, of building commercial life and production, the wealthier we're all going to be together. And I just, I love that vision. So when we talk about capitalism on this show, I'll, every now and again, I jump in the comment section or I see what people say on Twitter, if I have you know, some of the, the Ayn Rand people on or just some of the people that are not for regulation at all and just let the economy go and see what happens. There's always a certain amount of people that say, okay, that all sounds well and good, but then the rich just keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer and Jeff Bezos shouldn't have you know, $20 trillion or whatever he has right now or the rest of it. What, what's the... What's the boilerplate answer uh, well, to why you I believe that? I get frustrated that to be with those kind of cliches because they've been they've been around for 150 years and they've never been true. I mean, they, they weren't true in Marx's time, and everybody you know, quickly recognized that. You know, by the late 19th century, uh, in America, we had we had built the most prosperous economy in the world by far, by far, by far. Growing incomes, longer lives, healthier people, more opportunities for everybody. People are moving to the cities. Everybody's benefiting from capitalism. That's been going on for such a long time. And yet, here we are in 2018, and we're still recycling these, these Victorian-era <laughs> cliches about capitalism. I don't understand it. What, what do you think capitalism then screwed up if, if only just a marketing piece of it or something, where right now you sense... And, and I believe that it will not win, but yeah. that, that, it, that it somehow doesn't seem cool to be for capitalism, at least with yeah, young people. Yeah, that does seem to be the, the, the change. Maybe it's in the name, and I don't, I don't even have a problem not using the, the word capitalism. I mean, I, you, you probably have the same view towards this. I will speak the language that, that you can understand. Mm -hmm. And if, if I want to rebrand uh, capitalism as liberalism, which it probably should be, actually, liberal liberalism, then I'm, I'm glad to talk about that. Uh, at the same time, I kind of like the term capitalism. Mm -hmm. I, I have no problem with the term yeah. capitalism. Because, because it, it really does underscore a really important point that without private property and the, in the, in ownership of the means of production, you can't have a complex uh, production structures and you can't hire more people, you can't, you can't build great things, you can't have great cities, you can't improve people's lives. So what are the things that you think government should do? Well, I think of lots of kinds of rules that we should have, um, but I'm not a fan of governments in general. If there was some way that you could have, you know, an old-fashioned liberal state, you know, that was really minded its own business and um, kept kept civil war from happening, for example, you know, kept conflict, that kind of mass conflict, um, then that would be a, probably a good a good thing. Um, state is not very good at that, so um, I, I think, I mean, I've got, I've got the mind of an anarchist, essentially. I, I trust, <laughs> you know, I trust the chaos of, of spontaneous human action much more than any kind of, of, of imposition. Yeah. Uh, but I, but I am, at the same time, I do like the writings of the old liberals. You know, they, they imagine that the state should do something to keep something like a order in life keep civil war from happening, to keep people from killing each other, uh, terrible things like that. But beyond that state, should just it should be laissez-faire. It should just allow commerce to flourish and, and allow, allow problems to work themselves out. I, and people don't have confidence in that anymore, but not because of any failure, but it's, it's almost like the, the ideology of power has become a kind of a modern cancer that affects, afflicts everyone. And I think we need to do something about it. Wait, can you explain that a little further? Well, it's just that once you believe that you can control the path of history and you have an end point in mind, society should look like this, mm -hmm. then you want to use every kind of tool to hammer it in place. And this is, this is what I call right and left-wing Hegelianism, essentially. And it's a, it's a grave temptation. 
And so we built this, like we said at the outset, and we built this gigantic machinery we call the state, this total state, and it controls so much wealth and so much power and so much rest with, with uh, get, getting, you know, gaining access to it that it's just a kind of a constant moral hazard for everybody. Like, give, give me that state, and I'll make it do the right things. Right, so for the people on either side of this, whether you're on the left and, and you want to help those that you deem oppressed more, right. or people with less, when I believe their intentions to be good, even if their right. methodology, I think, generally is not good, or you're people on the right that want less of a state, but, you know, you're just on either side of this thing. How much do you think the, the system itself can move without breaking? Because what I think I'm noticing now is that there's a certain amount of people that really just want to trash the whole thing. And I do see this certainly more on the left right now because they're not in power. Mm. That there's this growing thing, uh, and this is why they're so into Marxism and all this stuff now. It's like, let's just trash the whole freaking thing and forget all the goodness that this has done. And they're doing it from their iPhones and you know, their the sense China, of, the, their the sense of irony is not great. But yeah, is there, is the there just a- The capitalist system, you mean. Right, yeah. is there just a certain amount that a, a system that's basically good can move before it snaps. And I, I would suspect that that's not much either way, really. Uh, you mean the, the commercial structure right now, or, com or the lives are capitalist structures, yeah. or you mean the state? Um, you know, what I see actually happening is the innovation is taking place so quickly, it's actually outrunning the, uh, the capacity of government to control it. And I think that's, that's really exciting. If I was gonna look at one point of hope in the world, is that the, the market mm -hmm. and the entrepreneurial innovative sectors of life, from the app economy to the gig economy to now with, with blockchain technology and everything is moving so quickly that states can't, can't even keep up. Right, so I'm there with you on that yeah, because and I- that's I, glorious. I, I, I'm very happy about that. I I'm, see that because it's, to me, it's like, wh how are people listening to all of these conversations, all of these podcasts that are out there and communicating mm -hmm. about them so quickly? And it's like the government can't, uh, it can't keep up with all yeah. of that. The change can't because people are lighting up all the time now in a much faster way. And I think we're changing in a much more rapid way. And I think that's actually really cool. There's a danger to it because yeah. we could just spin out of control and do all sorts of awful things. but. What you said? Well, what did you say before about the general inertia of people or something? That the, the general left to their own ways of figuring things out. They'll figure it out, and, and you know, uh, there's a reason why our politics seem reactionary on the left and the right. Everyone's trying to bring back something. There's a, there's a nostalgia on the left and a nostalgia on the right, and they're trying to use the state to hold us back. Like, and, and it, whatever, it's a vision of the, is it the 60s, is it, is it the 70s, is it pre-industrial revolution? You know, is it some Rousseauian fantasy of perfect <laughs> equality, you know, that, that the left might imagine, or, or, or the right uh, thinking about, you know, a world of high tariffs of the 1880s or 90s, or, but everyone's looking back to something they want to create, and it's, there's a real fear of the fu future on the left and the right. And it's a future without control. It's a future where we're able to travel where we want to, download the apps we want to, invent what we want to, work by ourselves, live where we want to live, be d digital nomads, tr you know, travel around, do what we want. This, this world without control. That's so control, cool. That's, that's, so that's cool. not <laughs> what people should be fearing. People, everyone should be going, holy cow, this is the freest, coolest thing ever. That's the world I want to live in. I want to that that obviously is why you're so attracted to Bitcoin also, right, and crypto in sure, general. Sh sure, Because sure. it's sort of the, the backbone for well, a lot of this, Well, I right? mean, if you think about it, I mean, we've waited our whole lives and actually generations of great intellectuals have lived, uh, lived and died for so long wanting something like a private currency that, that emerged privately, that operates without financial intermediaries, that the government is not controlling, that's global, that doesn't, it's not restrained by currency zones, that anyone could have access to. You know, a true democratic technology like Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, that is just a dream come true. That is, is glorious. That's why I write about it all the time and talk about it all the time. It is, it is the alt-right killer. It is the alt-left killer. It's, it's the thing that's going to ultimately, I think, um, protect us from these wicked ideologies that are constantly trying to control our lives.
Because basically, at some point, one of these ideologies is going to get too much control of, of the state. Well, I and hope of they the just fight with system. each other forever. I mean, you know, one of the things that, that, when I think about this sometimes, when you get depressed about the divisions in our public life and the way people are tearing, tearing each other apart and the way you open up the newspaper and this, you, you can barely even read it anymore. Yeah. You know, the news is what now? Uh, uh, yeah, news. I know, I know. But it's like down to Trump, you know, then it's like, you know, up with Trump, you know, and it's just, it's just this forever debate. And the one thing that I think maybe we should not be entirely unhappy about this is if you look back at history, when, when freedom emerges out of the high Middle Ages, it wasn't because any one great intellectual or any one great state or any one great power said, hey, let's let everybody be free. It was because there were so many competitors for power that they, nobody could, could gain the monopoly. Mm -hmm. It was the church. It was the, 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 the nation state. It was the, the, the locality. It was the monarchical state, uh, the, the landed aristocracy, you know, the, the, the rising merchant class. You know. So there are all these independent power centers strewn throughout European society, and nobody could get, get access to the final singular, singular control. No unitary power. And so that fight that took place among so many disparate powers actually led to a kind of flourishing of freedom. So, you know, in a sense, the fight between the left and the right today is not the worst thing if they just keep fighting and leave the rest of us alone. <laughs> right, right, right. All right, so before... I, I don't know where we're going to be that lucky, but... <laughs> okay, so before we spend the whole second half on the question that I started this whole thing with, yeah. do the people who want freedom, basically, and a light touch of government, are they always at a disadvantage because there's another set of people who will always use the apparatus against well, them, where if they're being true to themselves, they won't use the power to stifle other people it, or all sorts of other things. So in an odd way, our ideas are at a disadvantage. They always have been. We've always been a kind of minority, though. Even, again, over the last two or three hundred years of political history, we've always been that, that third way, that spy minority. But we had, we had rare victories, but big ones, you know, like the end of slavery you know, um, was just glorious. I mean, the protection of the great banking empires of Europe from, from the populist rabble, you know, from the, from the preachers who wanted to, to destroy it. There were these great victories, uh, the victory of free trade, you know? But, but we've won every once in a while, and it always changed the world. Because once you have a little bit of freedom, just a little bit, it just blows up, and it becomes awesome, and it's amazing, and it, and it, and it kills power because it's so powerful and so wonderful. But it's worth fighting for. And we've always fought mainly through ideas, not through armies, not through, through guns and controlling states. It's always been the philosophical awesomeness of this position. It's been the celebration of the common man, uh, uh, the celebration of, of wealth, uh, the, the love of, of consumerism and commercial life, the coming together of people, the ennoblement of people, the, the, the right of, of travel, uh, the right of association, and to do what you want, to have as many children as you want, to, to educate your kids the way you want to. That, these kinds of principles are compelling, and they've always led to victory for liberals, despite the pressure from the other two sides. And I think that's, I think that's gonna be our future, I do.